My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Bolton match angler John Inman, in whose company I am at the moment, was a very successful match angler on both the national club match fishing scene and the various seasonal leagues, before turning his back on all of that in 2005. Now we've already looked at your team match fishing days, particularly on canals, and specifically with small hard run fishing techniques and using squats in an earlier interview. These days you spend most of your fishing time organising, practising for, and taking part in individual matches on small heavily stocked commercial still waters. What is it then that small commercial fishers can offer that made the switch from rivers and canals so attractive? Well, it's just the seclusion that's just anglers there. It's developed for anglers, usually the private, such that there's no dog walkers and no one interfering with your fishing, really, and you've got peace and tranquility without having to compete with sailing boats, barges. A lot of them are are real little nature reserves in their own right. They've developed them, but there are water voles there, and it brings along its own natural um, environment, and so they're far more pleasurable, I find, Apart from river fishing, river fishing is equally as pleasurable um, because of being able to wade and taking the natural beauty of the places. Even the match fishing, quite picturesque and well developed. They've been developed just for anglers, so they know the facilities that anglers require, and so they've developed them to make the experience for anglers as best they can be, really, rather than a compromise between different users of the water, as in canals and lakes, where sometimes there's yachts which have to tack right in front of you, and canals that tend to just go over where you're fishing with them being quite narrow. The canal goes over your fishing spot, and it's ruined maybe for half an hour before it settles down. Sometimes it stirs up so much sediment that it takes a while for the fish to settle back in. And then another boat comes, so it's frustrating. Before the fish have settled, another boat has come and disturbed your fishing. You've just put some bait in and it's all been washed away, so you have to start all over again. And sometimes it's so bad that you just can't catch fish. So very often anglers, pleasure anglers, used to go first thing in the morning at, say, 6 o'clock. The first boat that came through, they knew that that signalled the end of the fishing that day, so they'd pack in, so they'd fish six until ten o'clock in the morning or late in the evening when the boats have moored up and tied up for the evening have a session then but the middle of the day it becomes sometimes like a motorway and as i say the two don't really mix as an on-course angler to me commercial fisheries with the various speciality attractions specimen capabilities and different species mixes are quite a recent phenomena and presumably are going to be easier to manage and control than areas where public access is not so restricted. What then has been the driving force behind the growth in popularity? They've been laid out for both pleasure anglers and match fishing with the pegs at designated distances between them and very often comfortable platforms and places level, close to the water's edge, reed fringed, really highly developed. And the choice of fish that's actually been put in is so wide a variety. And it varies from fishery to fishery. Some have small carp, and predominantly, and some are more mature have got larger carp. But some just specialise in put like croft. They specialise in putting the F1 variety of carp, which I believe is a cross between a common carp and a crucian carp. And they're supposed to be mules in that they don't breed, but they grow fast. I really don't know what the maximum weight of them, but I've certainly had them over four pound, but generally they run between 10 ounces and two pound, and they're free feeding fish and uh, very attractive fish, and lots of commercial fisheries put those in because of the sport. There's also Eid, which I think is a Scandinavian variety fish, and a lot of commercial fisheries locally, they stop with Eid along with Golden Orf, Unfortunately, I don't honestly believe that golden orf are really suitable. They're a very delicate fish, so the rigours of match fishing where they have to be placed in a net and tumbled about a little bit before weighing in, they seem to suffer a little bit more than the others. They do survive, but they don't seem to grow to good proportions, mainly, I think, because they're a little bit on the delicate side. Whereas F1 carp, a robust fish, they caught many hundreds of times 
and they're tough, hardy fish that withstand the rigours of being caught many times without any detriment whatsoever. There are many places with chub, and they particularly thrive in croft because of the stream that comes in one end and goes out the other. So it, it almost mimics a river in that the water is changed constantly, and this is ideal water conditions for chub to survive in. Not only do they survive, they thrive and they're in wonderful condition, shows how well they can be in still waters, and they provide good sport. Some commercials just stop with the common carp and also the mirror carp. These grow onto enormous proportions, so after a few years, they develop really good sizes, so you really do need much stronger tackle, and very often the people, the specialist carp anglers, then move in or camp out at night with the bivvies and fish for maybe just one or two fish. In Croft, there are some decent carp, not sufficient to actually go out purposely to catch them, because you'd simply be there a long time catching other carp, what they would call nuisance fish, the F1 carp and the smaller carp, and so the bigger fish wouldn't get really a look in. That's one of the benefits of commercial fisheries. They do stock to a very high level, so it makes the fishing far easier by comparison on canals, which invariably aren't stocked at all. The natural water with the natural stocking of fish there, so it definitely has improved it. The variety is is marvellous, really. You don't know what you're going to catch next, basically. One of the declines, what I find, is perch. Perch seem to be a, a very much a declining species, at one time, they were a nuisance proportion. Now, it's almost a rarity to catch one on some fisheries. I don't know what the demise of the perch is. Along with the eel, it's almost a rarity to catch an eel. And again, many years ago, eels were regarded as a nuisance fish in that when you caught one, it usually resulted in a lost hook. They tied your line up so badly that you usually have to put another hook on. And so it Wasted time in a match to actually tie another hook on your line as a result of catching an eel. Do you not also find that smaller fisheries now match the smaller demand for match fishing generally, with the bonus of both more and better fish to target? Exactly, yes. The fish are invariably bigger by comparison. The weights are enormous by comparison. If you had, say, 15 or 20 pound on a canal, it, it was an absolute rarity in that it might happen once every three seasons, say, in a match, and they invariably would be a weight of bream when you landed on a small shoal of bream. So that happened every three years. Now, catching 20 pounds is the norm, or even more. So when anglers go match fishing, it's certainly, even on Croft, throughout the winter months, um, January, February, when it really is tough going, the matches it invariably won with over 20 pounds. Uh, to give you an example of last year, the very first match of the Winter Series, the first Sunday in November, the message hadn't got out regarding the matches having started, and so very few anglers turned up. Only seven anglers turned up for the day, and it wasn't a good day. It blew a gale, it rained all day, it was a very unpleasant day, and a young lad, 19-year-old, won the match with £59. I was second, joint second, with £57, £55 was fourth, £53 was fifth, and I got home, averaged it all out, and I think the average weight was £49 per angler, and only seven anglers fished, and the smallest weight, I think, was £38 out of a field of seven, which on the day as it was, it, it was an awful day, and yet it fished really, really well. Obviously, the subsequent matches that followed went downhill, but only in, in regard of maybe £30 would win a match, and £25 second, and say £20 third. So it was still very, very good fishing, comparing it to any match on a canal. So it's, it really is excellent. But nevertheless, they do still need to be fished for. F1 carp are notoriously fickle. I think they've been caught so many times, they're educated to a degree greater than a lot of the anglers trying to catch them. And so they need a very delicate approach with extremely fine lines. Tiny hooks relative to the size of carp. I'm still fishing with maggot on the um, croft for carp with a size 22 hook and um, 0 0.01 millimetre diameter bottom. Even then, sometimes I think I'm fishing a little on the heavy side. Just need patient getting them out with 
with fine elastics, you can't couple fine lines with stout elastics. So I'm fishing, say, fives and sixes elastics with tiny ups. And if I'm fishing an 18, I can up that to um, an eight or a 10 elastic. I always like to see three to four feet or, or a meter or more of elastic coming out of the pole for it to be doing its job. You've only got a foot of elastic coming out of your pole. It's not really doing its job well enough. It's not cushioning that hook hold. It, it's too harsh. So when the fish twists and, and jags on the line, there's a greater chance of the hook losing its hold. So the softer the hook hold, the more likely you are of landing the fish. And just by using a little bit of patience with a lots of elastic out, which I don't mind, I always know that, that that's what it's there for. So if I've got 12 feet of elastic... I'm happier with 12 feet of elastic coming out for every fish I catch rather than three feet of elastic. The more elastic, providing it's a a snag-free swim, of course, you wouldn't do it fishing up to some kind of hazard, some reed bed. That's a totally different matter. But it does need an enormous amount of finesse, lifting and drawing the bait, teasing the fish, just gently lifting the half the length of the float out of the water vertically, and lowering it in really slowly, then leaving it for 15 seconds, moving it, trying different tactics, jerking the float out quickly, so that all of the floats out, using different tactics to induce a bite, being very precise at plumbing. Mark your pole to know exactly where you are, to give you a mental picture of where your bait is in regard to the bottom of the lake, being very precise as to whether there's a centimetre laid on, two centimetres, three centimetres, change it. So you've got to be always, if you're not getting bites, you've got to change. Patience is not a virtue for a match angler or a commercial angler at all. Persistence, yes, patience is not a virtue because you'll patiently catch no fish. You've got to be persistent to change. If you're not catching fish, you've got to make minute changes, move your shot about, move your depth, trying to find the fish, trying to find out what they want, change the bait. Try a new tactic. Try all sorts. Three days ago, I won a match on Croft. Having practised and got £60, £70 pound on the two practice days when there were hardly any anglers on the bank, but I knew it would be a different proposition when there were 20 anglers on the bank, which there was on Sunday. I started off fishing and no one is catching fish. The pressure of putting 20 anglers on the bank was that they just were it terrified the fish. They knew that there were anglers there and they just backed off. So I was followed them, or at least I tried to imagine what the fish really wanted, and I just followed them out with longer and longer and longer pole. For every section I put on, I caught three fish, and then they'd back off even further, so I put another section of pole and they'd back off, catch another three fish. But then, of course, you run out of pole. So you then I came back to the starting position, which was 14 metres, working my way up to 16 and a half metres. And even at 16 and a half metres, I was pendling in the bait beyond the pole tip two more metres, keeping the pole well away from them and just going in different spots, an arc in front of me, just a, a wide three metre arc, just dropping it in, dropping it to the other extreme end of the arc and then in the middle of the arc, never putting the float in the same place twice trying to always pick up that odd fish. Then, of course, I've got to 16 and a half metres. I had nowhere to go. So I just came back to 14, let everything settle down again, kept feeding the 16, 15 metre mark, and then started all over again, knowing that they'd work the way back in. Once the disturbance had gone, they would work towards me, which worked to some extent, but it got harder and harder. And instead of catching three fish for every extension of one section of pole, I caught one fish, but I knew I wasn't going to catch any more. So I, I kept having to ring the changes, and I won the match with £20, £17 second. Just really, really bitterly hard. Sections were won with £7 and £11. But that's what it's all about. You've know, got to just read what the, the fish want and what's happening and try to read the situation and, and just apply yourself to always get bites if you can just keep the bites coming. Sometimes it's extremely difficult to keep the bites coming, but feeding little and often, it's it's the oldest method in the angling repertoire. It is still the number one method for a match angler, rather than balling it in and putting all your eggs in one basket. It's still the number one method. You can always back out of little and often, 
because you've done no damage, but balling it in, you could have damaged your swim for the entire match by being, well, in my opinion, reckless. Some venues do respond to balling it in, but they're mainly in the south. Up in the north, it's a little bit tougher to keep the bites coming. So little and often, having as many lines running as you can, always have somewhere to go to. You feed a line, let it settle down for 20 minutes, do something else, try to pinch off another line, and then go back. And by reading what happens, you'll maybe catch two quick fish. The third fish might take two or three minutes extra. They're telling you something. They've got weary. They're backing away. So you feed again, come away from that line, let them come down and settle. And then you move somewhere else, try to pinch some fish in the margins or doing something else at full depth. You have as many lines running as possible up in the water, mid-water, on the bottom. And it's a um, bit of time and motion study. And you've got to keep tabs on what you're doing. But it makes life more interesting. It makes the match go flow. You're not just sat there like a Toby jug waiting for a bite to happen. You're actually making something happen. You're in charge of the situation. You're trying to always induce fish into feeding. So it's always been my method. And it's always stood me in very good stead. It's no good setting up one rig. Sometimes you need seven rigs. It takes a lot of time setting them up plumbing them up and keeping tabs on what you're doing. I always think you've had a successful day. If For every rig that you've set up, everyone's been successful. Then it's warranted the time and effort of setting that rig up. And it's proved to you that, in fact, it needed that rig setting up. Because if it hadn't been set up, you wouldn't have been able to fish that particular line and that particular bait for that particular size of fish in that particular area. So you need as many options as you can. Match fishing is not a lazy game. It's all about maximum effort. The reason I won on Sunday, there's no doubt in my mind, I was the only angler willing to fish 16 and a half metres. It was a day that it was possible, the wind allowed me to. Sometimes the wind is so swirly or so strong that you can't fish 16 and a half. But that particular day, even though it was swirling, the trees largely kept it off us, even though I only did it for brief time slots, each time I did it I caught fish off it, so it proved its worth. Other anglers were fishing 9, 10, 11 metres, far, far too short, in this gin clear water where the fish were terrorised by all these anglers on the bank. They knew exactly that they were going to be attempted to be caught. Many anglers don't give the fish the credit that they deserve in that they're much brighter than they imagine. Again, you mentioned the pole fishing there, and on the day we first met at Croft Fishery, you was knocking out small carp with great consistency on the pole, while those around you were catching little, if anything, on more typical carp fishing techniques. Yet still, they persisted. In many ways, it's quite a unique water, in that I don't know whether it's the constituents of the bottom, it's an old mill lodge, there's a series of three of them in a row, all connected by pipes, and they're all spring-fed, and it's extremely clear. It's like drinking water from a tap. And so when you've caught a fish, you can actually see them 10 feet away in three feet of water as you're bringing them in. And so if you can see them, they can definitely see you. And so it's definitely a long pole job, Croft. I usually start as 13, 14 metres and willing to add section. If I can catch at 13, I'll continue to fish at 13. But if I can't, invariably putting an extra section on brings more bites. Pleasure anglers there, they fish on the bottom. And in summer, the fish are not on the bottom. The fish are swimming within the top few inches or two feet of water. And um, it, not only is it warm with the sun on their backs, which the fish enjoy, but also they would die of starvation if they went to the bottom. Because as bait goes in, they intercept all the bait. It's so full of fish in the summer months. All these free offerings or any natural bait that falls through the water, it is taken within inches or, or the top foot or two of water. So by knowing that, by feeding little and often, very often pellet, that is the bait in summer, hard pellet, and lassoed pellet on the hook, then by feeding usually six pellets at a time, it's non-productive fishing more. You catch far less by feeding, let's say, 20 pellets or 30 pellets. So the pleasure anglers they tend not to have a, a, a match fishing mentality. When they feed, they feed every 20 minutes and they'll put 200 particles in and then fish on bottom. And the fish don't want to be on bottom. They naturally want to be up at the surface to intercept any bait that falls through the water. 
So they're fishing where the fish aren't. The only fish that will actually be on the bottom are bream, tench, crucian carp and perch. They're the ones who can't compete. They're not as quick. So they, they have to, to go on the bottom, hope that something reaches them. And they usually feed in the margins. Those species, perch, roach, tench, crucian carp, not mixing it with the F1 carp and the, the larger common carp and mirror carp. But even so, it's still got to use a bit of variety by fishing it in an arc. Don't put your bait in the same place twice. Try to move it about. There's that many fish, even though you, you're feeding in a maybe two metre circle with a pellet, six pellets every 20 or 30 seconds, and getting into a rhythm and a, an habit, and never putting the catapult down. Pulp should never put the catapult down because you've only got to pick it up 15 seconds later. So there's no point in. So you fish with the pole in your hand the catapult in your hand, and you simultaneously fish and feed constantly. And the way it works, I don't know why, I've, I've, I've often thought, but you pendulum the bait out onto the water fishing, usually in the region of 16 inches to 18 inches deep, and varying it between that. That's where the fish seem to want to lie. And the fish take within the first five seconds, as they float it in the water, you can count one, two, three, four, five. If you haven't had a bite in five seconds, you could be waiting till midnight. So you draw it out, then pendle it all out and drop it in somewhere else. And simultaneously you feed at that point. So you then again have a mental clock of working to five seconds. And usually it's within the first three. That's the optimum time. Maybe that's the progression of the bait through the water. I always think that when that bait hits the water because of the feeding regime at six pellets every 20 seconds, that you may have 200 fish in front of you and each of those fish are looking at your bait or at least a proportion of those 200 fish are watching your bait. As soon as that bait hits the surface, they look at it and say, is this okay? Is this all right for me to eat? Is it acting strange? And sometimes all 200 fish say, no, I'm not having it. So you'd lift it out and drop it in again and, uh, and keep feeding and whatever it is, within that first three seconds, you get one. I don't really know how it works. Only the fish know. But um, it so works out. You drop that bait in. You just do not wait 10 seconds. Usually five, seven seconds, pull it out. So it's a very active method of fishing and very enjoyable. And when it's working, you can imagine if you're catching fish within three seconds of the bait hitting the water, you can catch a lot of fish. Now, it never works that way. You always have dull spells to fish back off. You may have to even stop entirely and fish on bottom in desperation to get a bite while all the time feeding this same method in the hope that they'll come back. Because you might find that you actually see them on the surface. You see fish causing rings and you know that they're there. You know that they're there by feeding six pellets every 20 seconds. There's nothing happening and all of a sudden the fish arrive and you know that they're there. You can see that they're there by their actions that actually taking them off the surface. So then you exploit that. And then all of a sudden you stop catching, the fish are no longer rising, and they've just drifted away. Now it's very often difficult to say why. You think, what have I done wrong? You've done nothing wrong usually. It's just that they've taken a, the idea to move as a shoal somewhere else. But you must persist. You've got to keep on feeding, try to induce them to come back. But at the same time, again, don't put too many eggs in one basket. You've got to have a backup method. So if it, that does happen, you don't sit on it and wait a long time thinking they'll come back, they'll come back. Half an hour goes back. You keep fishing the same method. No, no, you've got to try something else. You try fishing on the bottom with soft pellet. Try fishing with maggot up in the water. Sometimes you put a maggot on the hook and all of a sudden you start catching again. And they're not roach. They're the same carp you were catching on the hard pellet. They've just changed. And sometimes caster works. So you need a caster rig. And in order to do the same with the maggot and caster, for some reason, I don't know what the reason is, that doesn't seem to work at that shallow range of 16 inches to two foot deep as it does with a hard pellet. You've got to be more prepared to go to a greater depth. So usually I'm fishing the maggot and the caster at maybe three feet, four foot deep as a start point. For some reason, again, only the fish know they respond better with maggot and, and caster at slightly greater depths than what you might do with the hard pellet. On some of the other commercial fisheries containing a good head of fur sized carp, I've come across serious carp anglers with stepped up gear deliberately pole fishing for the better specimens. 
Obviously, it's going to take more time to get those fish in. So what are the supposed advantages of switching to a pole from a traditional rod and reel outfit when fishing for big carp? Well, it's like all pole fishing. The old reason behind pole fishing is the finesse, the presentation. You can put that bait, your feed bait, by using cups on a six-inch round circle. You know it's there. There's no ifs and buts like catapulting where it, it would spread into an, a wide arc with a pole cup. And even though you may be fishing much more robust lines, these margin poles, you're still fishing with precision. Everything stepped up, line strength, hooks and the pole. But you are actually fishing extremely precisely in terms of where your bait is going with your feed bait. And you can um, inch it up and down the shelf. You can draw it up the shelf. You can pull it down the shelf. And you don't make a great big splash when you, you go in. You'd lower the pole gear into the water. So it's all about delicacy. Even at that size of fish, it's all about precision. You can dot that float down. You can read the float. You can use the fish with only a very short line, maybe as little as 20 centimetres, 30 centimetres between pole tip and float. So you're in total control of the float, total control of the bait. You can lift and draw it with great precision. And that's what it's all about. But even these big carp are quite wary. They don't want to be caught. So you have to use precise tactics in order to catch them. But as you rightly say, the carp can be big, but it still needs precision. It still needs finesse in order to catch them. As those who know me are aware, I'm primarily a sea angler who dabbles when the opportunity arises in all other aspects of fishing. And that has included fishing with an extremely long and very expensive pole on one particular commercial fishery stocked with eyed under the guidance of Nathan Lum, who despite its obvious advantages of accuracy and control, I still found it a very difficult piece of kit to use. More taxing to handle at times or wager than a rod and reel outfit. Yes, it is. One of the most important things about pole fishing is the rollers that you set up behind you. You must set them up, like everything else, with enormous precision. It should be pulled back at hip level. Try to, to pull back, so set your rollers. With, say, 9 to 10 metres, you can get away with one pole roller. If you're going beyond that 14 metres, you need two pole rollers, a minimum of two pole rollers. Beyond that, if you can, use three pole rollers. So it takes maybe 10, 15 minutes. You've got to go back and sit on your box, push your pole out, bring it back, feel if it's comfortable. And it's really important because not only is it efficient fishing, but up the two really main reasons. One is it saves breakages because poles are very expensive. And I've seen pole anglers who really don't know that they're using one pole roll of 16 metres of pole and it just breaks in two. The loading on the pole, it breaks. I've seen many poles broken and sections costing £300. You can't afford that. But the really main reason for setting up the pole so is for getting the fish out. So you pull back smoothly, feeding it through your hands when you've got, say, a, a decent fish or even an F1 carp of £2. You're feeding the pole back very precisely and smoothly, smoothly as possible, no jerks, and to, and you can only do that when you've got the pole rollers set up in a, a very precise manner. So it's really important. And many anglers don't put as, enough emphasis on the precision, and, or having even got two, some have only got one roller. I always carry three, one tripod roller, two four-leg rollers, and two V-rollers. So in total, I take five rollers, and I only ever use three, but I can adapt between the three. If I've got a big drop-off behind me, I need a one with, um, say, an eight-foot bank stick to support it at an eye level. You don't want your pole dropping down a dip behind you because if you let go of it, you'll simply lose it. It'll just roll away behind you. The terrain has a big bearing on it. So you've got to adapt, and it takes a lot of experience. Ideally... The grass behind you is at your hip level. Then you can just whiz it back in the grass. But very few places as kind as that to have that terrain. But usually, with a lot of thought, keep um, trying it. So you must, before you even start fishing, sit on your box, whiz your pole backwards and forwards, and be willing to get off your box and make adjustments. Carry one roller further away from the seat box to support it 
further away or bring one towards you or move them sideways. Put a lot of thought and effort in. With experience, it comes naturally. But I still see anglers, quite experienced anglers, just do not put enough time and thought into setting up rollers. On the day that you came over to give some tuition to Charlie Pitchers, who I was with at Croft, as soon as you got him onto the right method, he was away. Granted, he didn't catch as many carp as you, but it was certainly more than everyone else put together, and in the right hands, maybe his approach, which was a rod and reel, could have kept pace with your pole. So are there any circumstances when you would fish a rod and reel, or does it have to be the pole every time for you? You can actually fish the same rig in terms of hook, hook length, and the same bottom rig, and just use a, a waggler float. Very often a, a clear crystal float is good because they are more invisible in the water. And you do need to really fish sufficient weight, even though you're trying to fish with finesse, you need sufficient weight to cast. And strangely on Croft, if you cast and then draw, very often you draw the, the float back to you in order to what they call mend the line, to pick up the the bow of line that the, the wind has produced. That doesn't seem to produce. So if you cast and then disturb the float from its landing position, it's a, a negative approach. It doesn't work. Why? I don't know. So you've got to cast it in, leave it. Even though the back of your mind, you can see this bow of line developing and it's going to tow your float out of position. And again, it's that vital first three to five seconds. If you haven't had that bite in that first three to five seconds, then at that point, I do mend my line. And if you treat your line with washing up liquid, you can actually make it sink. And the best thing is to try to make it sink. So by taking some raw washing up liquid with you in a small bottle, you can actually squirt it on your spool of your reel. And usually you can make it sink. So a few rapid turns of the spool. But initially you cast, leave it five, six, seven seconds, if you haven't had the bite, it's usually in the first two or three seconds, then you can use a bit of aggression, flick the bow over, plunge your rod tip under, three aggressive turns of the handle of the reel. Do it as quickly as possible. You've got to do it with great speed. The more speed you use, the more efficient it is at dragging the line below the surface tension. And then again, wait. And sometimes you, you'll get a second bite of the cherry, sometimes not. It's always worth a try. Sometimes it's always worth doing it again. In other words, three more handle turns of the reel, bringing it to a position. But you soon work out what they want. If it doesn't work the second position or the third position, then you abandon it and just concentrate on the first position. Cast in, wait five seconds, reel in, cast again, wait five seconds. But of course, this is all combined with constant casting of bait always feeding of bait, six pellets, that seems to be about the right amount. Ten is too many, I find. Twenty is vastly too many. Many pleasure anglers, or less able match anglers, they get frustrated. Nothing is happening. And out of frustration, they realise, oh, I haven't fed. So they go into a stupor. So they just sit there in a daze. They're not really thinking anyway. What do I do to make something happen? And, oh, I haven't fed. So they compensate by not having fed for 15 minutes by putting 50 particles in. And that's the worst thing you can do. Don't forget, you've not had a, a bite for 15 minutes. So by putting 50 particles, mathematically, you've reduced your chances to 50 to 1 at best. Because now they've got 50 particles to eat and your up bait will be totally ignored because they were ignoring it before anyway. So you've got to just try to be patient and keep plodding away at that little and often and as I say, it's been the stalwart of all methods, and it still is. On the days when you can't get bites at all, so you're going through all these different regimes, you've got seven rigs up, and you're going round in circles, little and often in one, a little cup in another, and many different ways that you can approach a match. Sometimes just nothing happens, just nothing at all. And in those occasions, then you really do back off with feed. Or maybe with one particular of this, let's say you've got seven rigs, one of the methods you do go and you actually cup quite a large amount of, say, maggots in or pellets. And sometimes that responds, particularly in winter. They're lazy in winter. They don't want to chase a bait about. So by putting 50 particles in one spot, tight in one spot, 
and then just wait to the fish. They will respond because they don't have to work hard. They're not chasing a bait, so they'll just come and browse on the bait on the bottom. I'm talking now at fishing on the bottom. This only works when you're, you're fishing on the bottom, when it becomes harder in winter. And one method that I find works really well, so you have little tiny ways built up by experience of inducing a bite. No one's catching fish. One way that very often works, or at least brings a bite, is a tiny pole cup with a little hole in, a little cap on it. You sprinkle pinkies in it or maggots or a combination of both. And this hole needs to be about four millimetres in diameter. And you put in a maggot or a pinky or a double pinky on the hook and a very light rig with hardly any shot down so that the bait drops in a very natural way. Turn your little pole cup over and you can actually see the maggots. They crawl out of their own accord. And it's the most precise fishing, of course, not, no catapults here. So one maggot drops out every 10 seconds or a pinky drops out. So you really are putting it in a very, very small space. And by having your bait duck follow it through in a, a very natural way, as I say, this is not an hard on the bottom method. You're fishing it, lift and draw, dropping it in sideways and trying different techniques of lowering it in, maybe even just simply lowering the pole down very, 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 very slowly. And very often you'll get one that takes mid-water and it'll actually hook itself and the elastic will start coming out and you know that you've attracted a few fish. But it only tends to work in the most extreme conditions where hardly anyone's catching fish and you, you monitor what's going on around you and you're just trying to induce a bite. And that's another thing. You're always keeping aware of what's going on around you. You're just watching what other people are doing. Sometimes they'll lead the way for you. If you're not catching so much and they are out of the corner of your, your eye, you try to see what they're doing. But there's nothing wrong in copying someone else's successful method, so you copy or adapt their method into your repertoire, and very often it is a really good method to find out. You don't know what, what bait they've got. Sometimes you do, because you, you watch them lower it in. Sweet corn is a, an obvious choice. You can see sweet corn can very often see lunch and meat. So you know exactly what they're doing. You monitor their catch rate. Does it compare to yours? Are you doing better than them? So you again, you can adapt. If you're doing better than them, you can ignore them. But if they're keeping pace with you, you can monitor what they're doing and uh, maybe adapt slightly to their method. Sometimes you've got to go single-mindedly. You've got a method in mind. And sometimes you can say, I know that this will work. And you make it work. By persevering and just by feeding, you know it with your confidence because of your experience, you know that you're going to draw fish. And eventually, after maybe two hours of trying, the fish arrive and again, you just start catching lots of fish because you knew only based on experience that it would work. So there's many different approaches to angling, but one is flexibility. There's no hard and fast rules, especially between practicing and match fishing. You go practicing, thinking, oh, I've got it cracked. You go on the match day, you haven't got it cracked. It's a different day. For whatever reason, the fish are not responding. So you've got to then of many different ways. So that even though you think you've got a method, you always carry with you a backup method. Margins, mid-water, far distance, and loads of varieties in between. It makes angling far more interesting. I mean, all this variety. I'd be really bored if I only had one rig. I've nowhere to go. That's it. Yeah. But it takes time to set them up, time to put them all away. And for each rig, you might need a different bait and a different approach. You've got to set up um, pole cups for each one. And you've got to keep monitoring what you're doing all along. If one method's catching, well, sometimes it's not a good idea to stick on it. You know that it's dying, so you back away before it dies completely. Sometimes you go on to one method... You get a fish straight away and you know that you're not going to catch another. It would only do harm by fishing that bait again. So you come away straight away. So you fish two minutes, one fish, leave it, go somewhere else. Knowing full well that when you go back again to that method, your chance to get a fish straight away again. Again, that's based on experience. But you've got to read the situation. Sometimes it is difficult because you're looking at a blank sheet of water in front of you. But again, only experience tells you. But the main thing is, do not have just one method. Have several methods, at least three. Have at least three rigs set up for you to be able to 
interchange between at least three. So have you ever, or do you ever, stray from the small match fishing scene and do any specialist specimen hunting? No, that's never, will never be my, um, it's the way I am. I'm an active angler. I like to be active. I like to, my mind to be active. To give an example, I went to a, a match only two weeks ago and there was an adjoining water behind me, a specimen lake. It was near Blackpool. It's called Four Seasons Fisheries. There's a match lake and there's a, a large fish specimen lake. So they back onto each other and the anglers were just leaving. Two anglers were just leaving and they were rejoicing in the fact that they'd caught three fish and they'd been there 72 hours. And one was 24 pounds, I remember. One was 26 pounds and one about 20 pounds. One angler had caught all three and the other angler who was fishing with him, he'd caught none. But they considered that to be very successful. I'd be bored stiff because... They have optonics, they read papers and magazines. Then every maybe hour or two, they'll feed the swim and have a brew. It's not my style. I quite like match fishing. It's all condensed into a five or six hour episode. You've got a maximum effort. You've got to extract as much from the water in a few brief hours. So it's um, because of the way I like to fish, the energy levels I like to put in, the thought you're constantly thinking, And uh, you must never dwell on catching no fish in front of you, move and do something else. As far as I'm concerned, it's a very active method of fishing where um, you're using all your faculties to try to work out methods. A lot of it's based on practice sessions, but as I've said before, practice sometimes doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on what happens in the match. As I say, this weekend's match, which I won, was exactly £20. Two days before practicing, I had 60 to 80 pounds of chub. And on the day of the match, I had two chub and a lot of small F1 carp. So it was totally different. Practicing has no bearing. And especially the club anglers I'm fishing with, a lot of them fish quite close. They'll go pleasure in and they they fish only a short pole in the margins for big fish and they catch them. They then work out that they've cracked it fish lunch and meat, big bait in the margins, and uh, it will work in the match. No, it doesn't. Rarely does it. Occasionally it does, of course, but rarely does it. If you throw a keep net in, that must trigger them into thinking, oh, I, this is different. And they know that from a pleasure session where you don't use nets. So they must trigger some response within the fish, and they then become extremely nervous. They still want to feed, but... <laughs> They are very, very nervous. They back away or they take on a totally different guise to the fish that you were catching when you were pleasure fishing, when they were feeding freely and you were catching them freely. I can understand your logic to some extent. We all love to be catching fish regularly, but at the same time, I also like to have my string pulled by at least a half-decent fish. On the other hand, the match fishing end game is totally different and there must also be a lot of satisfaction to be had from beating everybody else on any given day. Certainly what you've told us here should help enormously in that regard. My thanks then to John Inman for sharing some of his match winning tactics with us here. (laughs) 